So there was some reference to Office of Student Success. Some people asked about resources earlier, and that's, that's why we wanted to pull this website up. Um, if you're having students who are having financial constraints, um, this is an, an office that can do some of that work, and Brian can speak to that a little bit. But they do a lot of other things, and so he's going to kind of give you a presentation on the broader uh, support there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, how's everybody doing? Welcome, all right. Well, my name, as Ashby said, is Brian French. I serve as the di executive director of the Office for Student Success here at UM. We serve as the hub of academic support services for students. And before I dive into the two major areas I wanna talk about, which are advising and tutoring, I want to try to circle back around to a question I understand was asked earlier about students who may be facing some aspect of financial insecurity or feeling anxious about whether or not they can afford to meet their financial obligations to the university. So I just want to emphasize that we also house our financial education program in OSS. So we are a resource that is sort of supplementary to our financial aid office. We do all sorts of things, help students understand the components of their financial aid package, long-term student loan repayment options, forgiveness options, things of that nature, but we also just help with general financial planning, personal budgeting, credit, savings. So any financial related topic that students might make you aware of that you're not sure where to send them, please consider us a resource. And above all, I'd, I'd really emphasize, please consider OSS just a safety net in general. We're here to help. We're well connected with our campus student support community in general. I think you've probably gotten a sense over the course of today that we have a very tightly knit student support community on campus. We know each other well, we work closely and collaborate closely with each other. So please don't hesitate to send students to OSS for any situation that you're not sure how to deal with, whether it's academically related or not. We are in the Lomason Center building, room 269. It's upstairs at the far end of the building towards the Oval and the Grizz statues, so the east end. Our phone number is 243-2800. And we also have a general email account office for student success at mso.umt.edu. All that contact information is at the bottom of our homepage as is typical for most university websites. So with that, I wanna dive into those two topics. First, advising. We serve as the sort of unofficial hub of campus advising services here at UM. So we are what's called a mandatory advising institution meaning that all undergraduate students have to meet with an academic advisor in their major or program of study prior to registering for each fall and spring semester courses. Quick question, how many of you had an influential relationship with an academic advisor over the course of your undergraduate career? A good number? Good. They're such important relationships. You know, advisors are pretty uniquely situated to be some of the earliest people that students come into contact with at the university and in some cases to maintain a consistent dialogue and relationship over the course of their entire time here. So needless to say, academic advisors are kind of at the core of our student support community here at UM, and they're also here to support you. And I forgot to mention, thank you in advance for what you do to support our students. We're all part of this thing together, helping to support our students as they pursue their academic dreams and work towards their long-term professional goals. So please consider us partners in that effort and, and really from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you'll do. I know you'll spend a significant amount of time with our students this semester and we're really grateful for that. So welcome and thank you. I wanna show you a quick website and then I will get back to the main TA training website, but we've tried to make these easy to remember, umt.edu slash advising. This leads to an alphabetical directory of our advising contacts in undergraduate programs of study. On the left-hand side, you'll see the listing of majors, and we've hyperlinked these, these titles in to lead to their home pages, so it can be a great exploratory tool for students who may not be 100% decided on a major yet. Sometimes you'll get questions about that and the whole major exploration and discovery process. So we've listed primary contacts in each program, their office location, phone numbers, and then backup department locations and phone numbers along with that individual's email account. So a lot of times students, especially at the early part of the semester, are unsure of who to go to for advising support. This will be a great resource so you can help to steer them in the right direction. 
So umt.edu slash advising. The other website, and this one shifts to more sort of traditional academic support, umt.edu slash tutoring. There are all kinds of tutoring resources at UM. What this page serves as is a repository of sort of our big picture tutoring resources open to all students. So we've got math tutoring options through the math department, the Writing and Public Speaking Center. I understand you heard from Jake earlier, Jake Hansen. Um, highly recommend the Writing and Public Speaking Center both for your students and for yourselves over the course of your time here. Our Study Jam program is a group tutoring program that offers support in a variety of different subject areas that students tend to struggle in. A lot of our STEM related courses we have support for. And so that's an evening tutoring program. Then we have information on TRIO as well, which is an eligibility based program. So not necessarily open to all students, but uh, basically low income students, students with disability and first generation and family to attend college students. Those are the primary eligibility criteria for TRIO. And then at the bottom, Missoula College Tutoring Resources. I just want to emphasize, we have to be realistic about who our students are here at the University of Montana. We're a public institution in a rural state situated in a university system that is 100% committed to open access to higher education for all. That's a wonderful thing to be a part of, but that commitment to access brings with it inherent challenges related to student success. Many of our students are not academically prepared for college level coursework. You will see that firsthand in your classes. That's why we have resources like tutoring and that's why we desperately need your help in connecting students with these resources to make sure they stay on track and ultimately stand a good chance to be successful in their studies. So beyond just knowing about these resources, we run a process called Early Alert every fall and spring semester. And we're hoping to expand that to summer this coming year. But what, how we do this, right now there's an enterprise level platform called Starfish that we will send you emails with links to your course rosters and it will depend on whether or not you are marked as the instructor of record for a course. So it may go to sort of the primary instructor faculty member who's marked as the course instructor and then they may delegate it down to you. But essentially they come as what we call progress surveys. Weeks two, five, eight and 12 of the semester. So we try to cover the whole spectrum, generally speaking, of the, of the semester. And we want your feedback about your students. Are they coming to class? That's the purpose of the week two survey. If you see students on your roster who you haven't seen in class, please let us know. When you mark these sorts of feedback items, and there's both opportunities for punitive feedback, they're not performing well in course assignments or in quizzes, exams, things of that nature. But you can also give students kudos through the system as well, sort of the gold stars. I've noticed you're doing a good job. Please keep up the good work. Today's generation of undergraduate students, probably needless to say, love positive feedback. So it's a great way to give them a sort of shot in the arm. So, but we can't help if we don't know there's a problem. So that's sort of an efficient mechanism for you to let us know. And we also have automated workflows built into this system so it notifies students' primary advisors where we can supplement you, proactively reach out to the student and try to connect them with relevant resources to help them succeed. 10,000 foot overview of some of the things we do and what we're here to support students and you. Any questions before I turn it over to Amy? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry, okay, I see you now. That's a great question. So resources for students who need support in learning and speaking English and communicating through English. That would be our global engagement office. So they have two locations, one in the International Center building, sort of between the, uh, the Interdisciplinary Sciences building area and our Payne Native Americans center and then they have another location on the second floor of the Lamison Center building. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all again. Hi everyone. I'm whoop, I'm Amy Kinch. I direct the faculty development office. Really happy to see everyone here today. So since this is the very last two presentations of the day, if everyone could stand up who is a 
TA or interested in teaching or a graduate student, that means everyone should stand up. <laughs> okay, everyone's got to wiggle, please. We got to stretch and do a tall stretch. Okay. Now, please sit down if you feel 100% ready to teach starting next week. Ooh. All right, congratulations. Um, <laughs> look around. Everyone's got a good view. Okay, my main theme is we're all in this together. Most of our faculty would probably still be standing right now as well. So you may now sit down if you'd like. But um, I'm here to tell you that there are actually a lot of resources to help you feel more excited and confident, confident about teaching, also to build your skills as teachers over the coming years. Um, and if any of you are interested, I don't know if any of you are interested in becoming professors or teachers long term, um, some of what my office offers can also help you with that. So the first big thing that I'm excited to announce is that we have a brand new online course, which is rolled out last Friday, um, and it's on engaging teaching practices. It's gonna be available through your Moodle shell. And UM Online has told me that by tomorrow night, hopefully at five, all of you will actually automatically be enrolled in it, so it should just be appearing under your courses on your Moodle shell. Does anyone not know what Moodle is? Okay, I'm glad I asked. So Moodle, <laughs> Moodle is our learning management system which means that um, almost all of our courses have a digital uh, sort of almost like home page that goes with the course. And each of you as a student have access to Moodle. If you just look up um, Moodle under umt.edu, you can log in with your net ID. Um, and on there is that, like if you were ever gonna take an online course, um, you would take it through there. There's actually a mandatory training that you'll have to go through on um, Indian Education for All, so that's located on there. Um, it's, yep, this is, the page, this, this is the page you'd go to, you'd log in using your net ID in the upper right hand corner, and then you'll see a list of courses available to you, and you also may end up working with professors you're working with to develop uh, supplements through Moodle. So this is often how our professors grade, um, how they keep track of a lot of interactions with students. And I'm happy to ask more questions, you know, answer more questions about that afterwards if people have specific questions. Um, if you're struggling trying to find the online course, we also are gonna have just a self-enrollment option. I'll be emailing that out to everyone as well. So there's a number of different ways that you'll be able to find it. But it's um, just a self-paced course about topics like um, how to make your courses more interactive. So both face-to-face -face instruction and online instruction. It's, this is, course was developed by Morgan Allwell, who's a professor in our teaching and learning program. And then also Marlene Zentz, Joe Costello, and Robert Squires from our UM online program. And it's just a lot of really handy tips about how to get started, how to you know, have students be more engaged in discussions. Um, there's a lot of research resources in there as well. So you can voluntarily do any piece of it. It's not required, but um, I think it could be a valuable resource. And then if you want to, you can actually get a certificate of completion for it, which is something that you could eventually put on your CVs, especially you know, if you're interested in um, comp you know, applying to be a teacher at some point in the future, that could be a very handy thing for you. We have a couple of other certificate programs that we're also gonna offer this fall, all of which are open to you. So one of them is a indigenous mentoring program, and that's really focused on how to mentor American Indian and Alaska Native um, students. And that's gonna be, that actually was developed under a National Science Foundation grant that we had last year, and we're gonna now be able to open that to all um, graduate students and faculty on campus. That's very exciting. Uh, we also are gonna do an inquiry project on online learning this fall. So Anybody who's really doing quite a lot of online teaching sort of currently in this semester or planning to do it in the spring, that's a great way to connect with other professors and graduate students who are doing the same and sort of bounce ideas off of each other and also get um, ideas for how to keep students engaged online, how to address a lot of the sort of typical prob problems that you run into with online teaching. Another opportunity that will take place next summer is we every year we run uh, something called the Scientific Teaching Institute, and scientific there means evidence-based teaching practices. So those are teaching practices that researchers have identified as particularly effective for students. That's also open to graduate students. One of them who took it is sitting in the front row <laughs> in June. Um, uh, it's really a neat program. It's developed by the Yale Center for Teaching and Learning, and again, you get a certificate actually from Yale for that one for completing it. Um, it's a week-long intensive that we run uh, we'll be running it in May or June, but that will be open to everyone as well. So um, the main takeaway is just to sort of look for opportunities that will be coming in through your email, through your umontana.edu email. If you haven't established that email address, 
Um, there's directions on the IT website for how to link your email address to a UMontana address, because that's how all of our communications go out to everyone on campus. But um, again, I'm from the Faculty Development Office. We're about to start a new office of organizational training and development that should be started in about two months. So the messages will be coming from one of those two, but you're really welcome to attend everything. And if you have thoughts on other resources that you need, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. We'd love to include you in everything and build things that are really relevant to you. Are there any questions? It's taller. It's a good thing. My name is Amy as well. I like to follow each other to confuse you. No, it's Amy Capilubo. I'm the Director of Disability Services for students here at UM. Um, I will tell you about sort of the logistics of how to provide modifications here in a minute and point you to an FAQ page and then a couple other things that might be useful. But I want to talk to you about why we're called disability services first, um, just to alleviate any questions or concerns you may have about that. Normally I don't lead with this, but I think it's important. So we're called disability services because of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Those are civil rights laws that guarantee access um, in institutions such as this that receive federal funding as well as uh, employment, um, institutions that don't receive federal funding, so public access, a variety of things, but we're covered under Title II. And why it's important and why we stick to that name is really about identity, right? If you remove the word disability, for some people we're removing their identity, okay? And we've gone back and forth with this for a number of years, and some people live on one side of this argument and other people are on the other side. But I'm never gonna think it's okay to remove someone's identity. Also, when students come to us, um, they're wanting some kind of protection sometimes or to request a modification. And so that the civil rights approach to disability would say, we gotta use the law, right? We've gotta go back to Section 504 and the ADA to say, okay, is this modification reasonable or is it not reasonable, right? There's then a social justice model that can kind of get applied, meaning that is this student, as Brian was saying, really prepared to be here? Do they have a place to live? Do they have food? So we're gonna look at those things as well, right, when we're working with the student. So we're gonna take a really broad approach, but we use the word disability so we're easily identified. That's the simple reason. So please refer students to us as needed in your course syllabi, whether it's the one you're writing or the one a faculty is providing to you. We'll have a statement in there that talks about disability services. Um, if you are more of a traditional TA in the class, you might be asked to take notes for a class. Can I just take this? All right. So you, hey, hey, okay. Whenever I get the mic, I get kind of excited. I'll try to stay on task. <laughs> okay, Brian knows this is sometimes a problem for me. Like, hey, you want to get, uh, no. I was, almost went down the joke path, but I stopped. Thank you for laughing, though. All right. I know, exactly. Okay, so we'll go to the, um, well, let me tell you about the cool tools first. So if you are taking um, notes in a class, right, if you have to do that, or the faculty member says, hey, I want you to take notes for this class, we have a really cool program on campus that's available to all students. And so really all students should use this if they struggle with taking notes at all, or if you wanna remember what the instructor said. So it's called Sonocent, right? S-O-N-O-C-E-N-T. And, and if enough of you want this, we could even get a specific training for you guys so you can download it. You can go to, um, oh, what is it on IT? What is that called, Brian? It was Solution, Cent Solution Center. So the IT Solution Center, and you can find out information. You can also just email me. And what Sonocent does, is you pull up the PowerPoint on one side. It's a three-way split screen. We just put it on your computer. Uh, you can take your notes in the middle and then it records a lecture per slide, right? So if you're taking notes for someone, you can just send them that, right? You email all the students that. Um, it's available to you. It's available to everyone. It's a really cool program. So I really like it. I want everyone to use it um, because we just made it available to every student. We kind of tried to prove up with it. If it works for our students, it's gonna work for everyone, right? I mean, why wouldn't you want that? It's cool. I think it's cool. Um, the other program is called Read Write. I mean, I guess maybe a lot of you are like, you know, visual learners where you really like writing and reading everything in print. I'm the total opposite, so this stuff is rad for me. Um, and the other program is called Read Write. What Read Write does is it will read everything on your computer out loud. You can cut and paste out of textbooks. Um, then there's also this really cool plugin for Word that will create automatic tables of contents called an EPUB plugin, which is awesome. If you guys are writing your dissertation, you want to just publish it in EPUB. It's so cool. Anyway, um, so we've got some cool tools. If you wanna know about this stuff later on, I can tell you they're available to all students. They're sort of born under accessibility guidelines, which is awesome, but really it's like using your phone now. Do you guys ever take a voice? Like we you use voice on your phone, right? Well, that's born from access, right? That's why that stuff exists. Um, but now everyone uses it, so it's no longer accessible, right? We don't view it under the accessibility guidelines anymore. Just like you don't look at an elevator and think, oh, that's just for people who have a mobility impairment, right? But that's ultimately why they're on campus. 
Anyway, um, so under the faculty staff pages, probably the thing I want to point you to the most is this frequently asked questions. And this frequently asked questions uh, came from a survey uh, that we did a couple years ago about what people wanted to know about. And TAs, the one for TAs that made the most sense um, or the one that was the most popular is this. Um, what should uh, people do when we ask for a modification that limits, ask for extensions and deadlines and attendance, right? That's a big one, okay? Um, so modifications have to be requested bef in advance, okay? A lot of freshmen, they're gonna just kind of see, right? So if I'm an incoming freshman, um, I have Crohn's disease, let's just say I have Crohn's disease, and I'm like, man, I don't know, I'm in college now, I'm cured, <laughs> right? Like I'm just gonna decide that I don't wanna deal with this anymore, I'm gonna be fine, no problem. Well, two weeks into the semester, they have a flare up, they miss two sections, okay? They don't say anything, because they don't wanna deal with it, then they miss two more sections, and then they have to go home for their aunt's funeral. Well, now they're coming to you and saying, hey, I, I need to do this, I should have done it before, what should I do? You have the right to tell that student no under the law. If it's a freshman, struggling with this, we might encourage you again to look at, okay, what's reasonable here? Can they make up other work? Is there something else that can be worked out? But technically, you don't have to do it, and we'll always tell you that. So please call us in these circumstances. Um, the situation I just described, you might be willing to give flexibility to that student if they described it the way I did, but they might not do it that way. They might come into you, have never been to disability services, and say, I'm demanding my rights. This is what I think that they are, <laughs> right? You might get someone who's kind of belligerent and you might not want to work with them then, okay? So please call us if any of these things occur or come up for you. Sometimes students do ask for things that are totally not reasonable. And then we're gonna want to meet with them. Um, we're gonna want to talk to them and figure out a better path forward. Like what's gonna make sense for you and them? I mean, the point is, is that we're here to serve you as much as we're here to serve the students. I mean, that's definitely what our role is. Um, and to make sure students are asking for things that are gonna be reasonable, setting themselves up for success in school with requesting these things. And then on the flip side for you guys to make sure um, if you are really frustrated with the situation, you can vent to us in a comfortable way and that we get that and we can help you not make mistakes with the student, right? Because sometimes that can get you as well. Like if you say, oh hey, we'll just work it out later. And then they email you the day before the semester ends and you're like, you didn't come to class. And then the student's like, well you said we'd work it out. Like that happens. And it, it seems totally unrealistic, but it happens. And it's not right, but it happens. Um, so that's uh, one of the ones. And then the other one, I think Mike Frost talked about uh, behavioral things earlier. So if a student's behavior is disruptive, right, um, someone might have a disability that, you know, they're, they're raising their hand in class and maybe taking up, they're discussing really personal things, or they're doing something that is, generously disruptive, right? Um, in those cases, if you feel like it's a disability rated reason, I'd still encourage you to call and talk to us uh, because there is always a line, right? And sometimes we can guide that student. Um, we have more students with social challenges coming onto campus now and we, have a, we work with them very well, as much as we can to say, okay, say this, not that. I'll give you a really terrible example, but the student um, has left. I had a student in a nutrition class who asked about eating human flesh and what the caloric content was of human flesh. And because of the way the student appeared, um, physically appeared, and the way he asked questions, it came across, like, like if I said that, people would think I would just, I don't know what they would think, right? But they might be able to tell from other things that I was joking or kidding, but this guy, nobody thought that that was the case. And so it went all kinds of places really quickly. People were like looking on his face, like they were trying to find him on Facebook. They were like concerned about their safety. like. He's not gonna do anything. He just had a question. He was like, he started the Mediterranean diet last week and he was just curious about how that worked historically. Like it was just way off the mark, right? So we intervened, he apologized, we took care of it, not a big deal, okay? Um, but it was really scary for members of that class who had viewed this person as being isolated. He fit a profile. Like he, like you could, he, you know, if you look this guy up, he fit a profile, right? Of like, anyway, I won't go into what that profile is, but he fit one for people, okay? so. There are gonna be differences and inappropriate questions. Um, and then there's gonna be things that are generally disruptive and not okay to say, right? Anything you get like that, um, Phil, I'm on the behavioral intervention team, you can send that to me, you can send it to folks, because this could have been a student, right, that maybe was dangerous or threatening, right? So I want you to take that seriously. I mean, I can make a joke about it because I knew the student really well, and I was like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> this is what you said, awesome, right? <laughs> Funny part of my day today, okay? Um, but there are other ones where I've gotten that are more benign where it's not funny, right? 
and it's just something that you guys thought. And, I, and we don't want to be uh, punitive to students. You know, I, I'm, my role on the committee is really to make sure we're not discriminating against students, and I, we do that uh, quite a bit. But at the same time, we want you to report those things because some of it might not be just freedom of speech, and some of it might be, right? But we have to kind of figure that out. Um, and the way we figure that out is we, maybe we have multiple reports of things, right? Maybe that person stopped taking medication that week and they actually went to the food zoo and inquired about it, you know? Like maybe they did something that was even scarier. And so your report will help us kind of figure that out. So um, that's something else. If you feel like a modification is unreasonable here, it's going to be, you know, basically call us. We'll always try to figure out a way. What's in your syllabus is, is basically is your contract for the class. I'm sure you guys have talked about that, right? So if your syllabus doesn't require something and then you're wanting to grade on that, that's going to be tough. Right? So we're going to want to work that out. And, and, and those are just lessons that um, we teach even working with new faculty. Right? Um, if something isn't explicitly stated, then students always find the line. Right? Like I'm always learning things that surprise me. Right? I was like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. And then it became a thing. So I, maybe I need to be a little bit more descriptive about that. If, you, if attendance is something that you <laughs> require, then it should be required. And there needs to be a reason. It can't just be because you said. Okay? If uh, showing up to extracurriculars um, is gets them attendance points, um, and then a student says, I can't show up to these for the following reasons, and they're disability-related reasons, well, they're going to need to request an alternative assignment. That's more specific than me saying a thing. Sorry about that. Um, but we can work with you on alternatives to that, right? So if there needs to be something that is an alternative, we can help figure out and brainstorm with you through those. Um, I can stop now for questions. Go ahead. Oh, and no, no, go ahead. Okay, yeah. If you ask, well, you ask me, so I'm going to answer it. <laughs> Good. Yes, it should be mandatory. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I can't mandate stuff for faculty. There's lots of reasons um, for that. Uh, have to do with the faculty union and other things. But yes, it is absolutely best practice. That is the most protective thing you can do as a faculty member because we have, as an institution, we have to provide notice of access, always. And the more we can provide that notice of access, the more covered you are. Yes. Yep, absolutely. There's three of them. In fact, you can choose them. Um, they're a little bit old, but yeah. So syllabi statements. You can just pick any of these and then modify them. So they're right there. Yep, option one, two, and three. Yep, so you can modify those. Thanks. Another, yep, another question? The very back. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good, so as, okay, so here's, this is, that's a good question. So we serve students, right? Um, if it's a, a faculty request, then technically HR would serve that, uh, do that. But if you came to us, we convert textbooks that are only in electronic format to printed format. So that's not, that's just not an issue. We can do that too. We'll either print it out for you or we can purchase a copy of the book. If there's a, a huge cost differential, we can do that too. And also, it, it, in my opinion, it should be a reasonable modification as a faculty member as well. Yep, you're welcome. Sure, so if a student needs an aid in the class, uh, the student should be bringing the aid with them. And we will encourage them to let the instructor know that, hey, we're, I'm going to be utilizing an aid in the class. We just do that as standard practice. I want to say most of them do, but not in all cases. Um, so you won't ever be expected to provide an aid. Is that maybe what you're? Yeah. No. OK. Yeah, OK, right. So yeah, th thank you, and no, OK? Um, we're not going to do that. So that's called a personal service, right, having an aid. Now, we might, there could be some extenuating circumstances there where we might pay additional um, for an aid to go to that class. It's possible that we might not be able to make the class accessible to that student in some other way, in which case we would be hiring a grad student uh, TA to go to that class with the student to explain that. 
but it would never just be an expectation added on to your role. Now, a faculty, so if that is the case, you can call me, I'm, I said that, I'm gonna make the budgetary decision on that, and that's what we would do, right? There's no question in my mind about that. Um, but if a faculty member asks you to do some of those things and it's starting to kind of look blurry, right? Um, I didn't mean that as a pun either, sorry. I make these bad puns all the time, and they're really insensitive. <laughs> I have to go to a sensitivity training a fair amount. <laughs> okay, because then I stop making the puns and then it gets worse. Okay, um, anyway, I told you I get the mic and then it's just do, 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 do. Okay, um, but back to your question, you should not have to do that, no. But we might have an aide that comes into class, or if you have a blind student in class who um, maybe their blind skills, uh, and they just go to you and say like, I can't see any of this, as you might have seen, I'm blind. Say, have you been to the disability services office yet? And they might say, no, that's okay. They should go there, right? And you could even go with them if you want and say, okay, this is what the class looks like, and ask them. Say, do you want me to come with you to this appointment? Um, you know, if, and you can just describe like what stuff you'll be doing in the lab, and then we can figure out the right person. As an example, when we have to uh, proctor Spanish exams or French exams, and there's a spoken part, we can't just have our student employees do that if they're not fluent in those languages. So we have to get people to do that. And we would do the same in a lab. Okay. All right. Yes. So we don't disclose uh, disability to faculty members. We have the students do that. And so we do that via a letter. And so we email the students a letter or we print them out copies of a letter. And then we encourage them to provide you with that letter either via email, most of the time via email, um, now or uh, in class, or not in class, or in writing during your office hours. So there's not a chance that it can get missed. You can share anything. you. We tell students not to disclose the nature of their disability to faculty um, for a variety of reasons. Those reasons are largely have to do with um, perceptions about certain disabilities, right? It's just better to not go down that path. Um, but if a student does disclose the nature of their disability with you, um, you can share it if, you, if somebody else has an educational need to know, right? So the educational need to know would be something that you would have to state, okay? If you have specifics, I can answer those too, but I can be done, thanks. <laughs> That last question, oh yeah, clap, clap her off. She may, uh, she and Jake may be doing some stand up together in the future, you know, you never know. Uh, FERPA, if you don't know what FERPA is, um, how many of you do? Okay, about half, a little bit. So that, that is a, a privacy, a federal privacy mandate. Um, so that would be covered under FERPA. And so that, that uh, obligates you not to disclose information about your students to other people for non-educational purposes, right? So that's the... Uh... So um, we've come to the end. Um, please fill out your surveys. Extremely important for me in terms of getting feedback on what, what you want more of in particular so that in the coming year, if there are specific workshops uh, that you can imagine, to support you as a teacher, um, write that down. Say some specific things that, that we could work on. The grad school is always kind of looking for ways to hit the broader student population with some things that, that will, um, will enhance their teaching and professional development. I also want to add that the Faculty Development Office website has some faculty development opportunities that aren't related to teaching that grad students can also attend. That might be a grant writing workshop, for example, or a research uh, workshop. Occasionally we'll have an NSF person on campus. So pay close attention to that website and I often will send out emails with information about those kinds of opportunities as well. Any other questions for me? Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Bring the energy and attention to your classes and uh, Come by the grad school in Lamison if you need to talk to me. Bye.